Hi, welcome to We Are Only One. We have a very exciting show today. It's called uh, Spiritual Rules of the Road. And we have the author Bill Engelhart, who is coming to us from Marin County, California. And we're going to be learning some practical tools as we drive through the journey of life from him. Today's guest is Bill Engelhart, author of Spiritual Rules of the Road, also senior minister of Unity in Marin County. And I must say that Bill is a Renaissance man. The more I've learned about him, you have a black belt in karate, and you are a car enthusiast, as well as a black and white nature photographer. So um, today, I believe we're going to hear from the car enthusiast, uh, in large part. Uh, could you give us a, the scoop on uh, spiritual rules of the road and uh, what brought you to write a book like this? Very well, thank you, June, for having me on your show. It's uh, really a pleasure. Uh, for me, writing this book uh, was really an, an evolution. It was really an evolution of understanding myself. And when I when I did that, I looked at three things that I really enjoy, and one of those things was spirituality, and the other was humor, and not the least of which is cars. And so I decided to put something together that combined all three of those things. But I remember a couple of years ago when this idea came to me, and I started to research it, I said, I wonder if anyone else has written a book about humor, cars, and spirituality, and I Googled it and came up with absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> So I figured, well, that uh, might have uh, dissuaded someone else, but uh, for me, I felt uh, that that was really the call, that this is what was mine to do, mm -hmm. was to uh, take spiritual principles, to be able to uh, explain them in a way that I think all of us can understand and appreciate, because we all have experiences with cars and uh, at one level or another, whether it's car ownership, car repair, buying a car, getting broken down in a car, all those kinds of things that happen. And if we look closely enough at it, we can discern spiritual truths. And those spiritual truths are what I tried to uh, denote in this book, uh, The Spiritual Rules of, of the Road. And I really felt that uh, when, I, when I got my driver's license uh, many moons ago, that you had to go through the uh, driver's ed program, and you had to study the book, and you had to go take a test at the Department of Motor Vehicles to really prepare you to be able to drive a car. And I thought that was all well and good, but as I grew older, I started to recognize that it would have been really nice if somebody would have given me a book about the spiritual rules of the road. So when I face uh, challenges in life or I face difficult decisions, that I have, have been prepared at least as much as I had to prepare for my driver's test when I was 16 years old. And so that's why I put this book together to be that kind of a manual. and. Uh, actually to make it about this size that so you can see so you can actually fit it in the glove compartment of your car instead of being on a bookshelf somewhere. Because uh, the way it occurs to me is that when we really are looking for some kind of insight, we're, we're generally on our way somewhere. Uh, maybe we're on the way to the hospital to visit someone who's ill, or maybe we're going to have a difficult conversation with somebody and we are looking for some insight or there's a challenge. Whatever it is, that if we're in the car and it's already there, it's the kind of book you can flip open, go to that chapter, and give yourself a, a little bit of a spiritual tune-up before facing some of those challenging situations. So I, I believe it is one of the first books, if not the first book, other than an owner's manual, that was actually written to be kept in the glove compartment. So. <laughs> <laughs> one of its many claims to fame, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say I'm in New York right now, and I'm enjoying reading it on the subway. Okay. But I have also uh, kept it in my glove compartment in my car when I'm out west. And it, what I really like about it is you have so many um, practical tools that one can get at a glance. It's, it's 
the kind of book you can pick up and if you're in traffic and you're stopped for a while, you can read a quote and read half a page and you're nourished by it. And I love something like that because we don't always have time to sit and read a hundred pages at one time. And um, I, I just, I had a really uh, great time reading this and I want to hear more about its development and your intention with it. If you would share some of that with us. Sure. Well, my intention, again, was to really uh, be able to look at spiritual principles and, and strip away the dogma and ritual that uh, has surrounded so many spiritual practices in the past. And, and it's been kind of kept behind smoke and mirrors and put into difficult words or where you might have to be a think you need to be a theologian to really understand spiritual truth and what I try to do is really pair all that back and be able to get down to a truth concept that we can all understand and again using this analogy and and, and I, I, like I said I believe humor is a is a great way to get a message across because if we remember the humor in it then we're more likely to remember actually what the principle is and uh, I, I give you an example. I think one of the uh, things that stands out for me as a car owner, I've been driving cars since I was uh, 16 years old. I bought my first car when I was 16. And, uh, and I remember back then it was a 1974 Pontiac Grand Prix. And uh, it had uh, like 50,000 miles on it. And back then that was about the life of the car. At 50,000 miles, everything falls apart. You have to rebuild the whole thing. So it's... That was my tutelage into understanding cars, and one of the things from growing up in Chicago I had to learn about right away is this thing called rust. And from New York, I'm sure you're familiar with rust as well, that uh, that was kind of a mechanism, even if you kept the car running for many years, that sooner or later they would rust out from under you unless you took really good care of it. And so, of course, my car had rust on it, and every year I'd be getting out Bondo, which if anybody's ever worked on a car, it's this pink goo that you, you mix together and you bond onto the car and then you sand it and you paint it and, and you do all these things to cover up the rust. But as rust never sleeps, which we've heard that before, <laughs> and it doesn't, that every year I'd get a new chance to go back and redo that bondo all over again and again and again. And I was thinking about this and thought, well, what kind of spiritual principle underlies this kind of idea of rust and covering it up? Mm -hmm. and, and I started to think about the concept of forgiveness, or actually the concept of unforgiveness. Mm. And to me, unforgiveness is really like rust. Mm. It's one of those things in our consciousness that never sleeps. When we're unforgiving, it's as if the, it's the equivalent of rust on a car. And it just continues to eat away and eat away and eat away at the metal and the structure of the car. And it's up to us to be able to not just cover it up, which I think many of us do when it comes on forgiveness. We don't want to think about it. Or when we do, we get upset about it. We don't want to actually move into forgiveness. Or maybe we haven't spent enough time figuring out how to do that. And the longer we're in on forgiveness, the rust grows and grows. And we may patch it. We may put something over it temporarily. But just like rust on a car, it's going to come back again and again and again. And eventually what that does to the car is it really uh, degrades the structural integrity of the car. So if you were to get an accident or something else, that where there's rust, there's not the strength that was in the car before. And I believe that's really a perfect analogy to the whole idea of unforgiveness. When we carry around that unforgiveness in our consciousness, it's as if we're carrying around this rust that's just growing and growing and growing. And it's really undermining the integrity of who it is that we are. Because we're spending mental energy on this idea of not forgiving someone, and maybe part of that unforgiveness is we're not forgiving ourselves. But either way, the only way to fix, truly fix rust is to cut out the metal that's around it and to be able to patch it with brand new metal, brand new steel. And when it comes to our forgiveness, the only way we can really forgive is if we're willing to let go of the past, if we're willing to reconcile within ourselves that it's healthier for us and for the whole situation for us to be able to get to a place of letting it go. Then that's really the repair that's needed in our own consciousness as well as in our own cars. 
And then our car will run a lot better, won't it, when we're uh, not harboring you know, that rust of resentment and anger and whatever else the ego uh, can put on the car. Um, that's right. That's, that's, that's right. great. Forgiveness and rust. That's a great. I heard, um, and I'm sure many people have, uh, trying to get revenge is like... Um, taking poison and expecting the other person to die, um, you know, and how, how much lighter we feel when we do get into the forgiveness space and the letting go and the realization that really no one in the spirit level can really harm us. That's right, and the, and the truth is forgiveness isn't for the other person. It's really for us. Mm -hmm. Because we're the one that's carrying around that burden, as you drew the analogy about taking the poison. We're the ones that have taken the poison, and uh, it's really the cure, the anecdote, the antidote for us is to be able to really be in forgiveness. And again, it's really for us. It's not so much for the other person. It's our willingness to let go of that burden, to be able to put it on the side of the road instead of carrying it with us wherever, wherever it is that we go. Because that's draining, mentally, emotionally, physically, and it's going to show up in all three of those areas the longer we hold on to it. And that's really kind of a novel concept, I think, even though it's, I know the film wars have been around a while and the unity and the new thought movement uh, since the late 1800s. Um, but in my childhood, if someone had said to me, you forgive someone for yourself, that would not have made sense, you know? But That's, now it really does because you do feel so much better when mm -hmm. you do. And that's where the spiritual truth that, you know, really comes through. It's something that we all intuitively know. We know when we're carrying around unforgiveness, it's not hurting the other person one iota. They could care less. They may not even know that we're upset with them. But every day we, can, we wake up with it, we're the one that's carrying that burden around. And so for me to be able to lay that burden down, to be able to bless it, to release it, um, that's just a real joy. And it really uh, improves the life that we're living right now. It sounds like uh, forgiveness is one of the uh, key ingredients to a GPS system in, <laughs> in our car. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, have, I have a GPS system. I have one of the earlier ones. And the... Uh, Whenever you went off track, if you didn't follow the direction, it would always say recalculating, which to me just sounded like a nice way of saying, hey, stupid, you took the wrong turn. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so now I have a GPS that if I go a different way, it just it doesn't say anything. It, it just recalculates automatically. So I think it's forgiving me. <laughs> <laughs> well, they are so handy. I mean, I... I've been driving maybe 30 years, and I only got a GPS three years ago. And it's kind of, for me, uh, uh, parallel to um, the spiritual reawakening I had with unity and universal truth principles. I lived a lot of my life without that. And then, boy, what a difference. You the journey you can go anywhere now you're free to choose um, as opposed to a very strict map if you will that didn't work that's right and when it comes to the gps system as i've reflected on that and spiritual insights that we can get from that on the gps we can enter in our destination and we can say, I want to go the direct route, I want to go by the highways, I want to avoid highways, I want to go on freeways, uh, you know, pretty much there's all kinds of different routes that you can take. And that's very true with our life. We're the ones that get to decide, do we want just the direct route or do we want to take the scenic route? You know, those are options for us. When we're going from play, play, place A to place B, how is it are we going to get there? We can lay out a plan, but even with the best laid plans, we can run into detours. We can run into changes that we had not expected that may take us off the highway of life and put us on a side road. And we can complain about that and we can say, well, I wanted it to be done in a shorter amount of time. 
which I think happens often is a, is a big part of why we get upset at, at life, at spirit, at God, because things aren't happening in the time frame with which we think it should happen. And I think when we get into the GPS and we run into a detour and it takes us on a side road, if we could just accept that this is the best situation right now, that this is going to be the best calculation that's going to get me where I need to go, then we kind of let go of that anxiety. Mm -hmm. We let go of that um, upset around the road changing when we didn't expect it. Now, one of the things that I've, it's really hit me, uh, hit me right in the consciousness <laughs> is when I, when I think of uh, GPS, and I think if it says turn right, I turn right. If it says turn left, I turn left. Whatever it says to do, I just do it. Now, do I trust God? Do I trust spirit as much as I trust my GPS? Wow. Because when we get that intuition about doing this or doing that or doing this kind of work versus that kind of work or being in this relationship or ending a relationship or whatever it is, do we really listen to that? That's a question that uh, really came up for me when I just, no matter what the GPS said, I just did it. But when spirit speaks, sometimes I think I know better. Uh-huh. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> it's a good learning, and that's a great uh, analogy. I went, I heard someone uh, mention GPS as a uh, God's positioning system, you know, or, or grace. And uh, I, I'm going to remember that because when we do get out of our own way, we really are in the flow, and uh, I think sometimes. Uh, we go places that we wouldn't have um, it, when we're flowing. Better places. <laughs> and if we can enjoy the journey, which is a big part of my book here, I talk about uh, enjoying life is not about how fast we get to the end of the road, it's about enjoying the road that we're on. Yes. That if we get put on a side road or we get caught in traffic and we just have to sit there for a while, that if we can look for the good, if we can say there's something good for me, and I know there's many times I've been knocked off the highway and you end up going through small towns and in the middle of Texas or somewhere else, that I found really interesting things that I wouldn't have found if I'd have been on the main road, on the super highway where you're just going 70 or 80 or higher <laughs> <laughs> speeds. That uh, it's on the side roads of life where we go slower, where we can enjoy the view and we can learn more about ourselves when we face the unexpected, when we face those challenges, when we're on those detours of life, it's really an opportunity for us to really understand ourselves more and to really experience life. Because, again, life is not just about getting to the end of it as quickly as we can. That's not it at all. It's about really enjoying the journey that we're on and recognizing that uh, maybe my plan isn't God's plan in that moment and that there's something greater for me in this. And that makes the journey so much more rewarding than just being upset that I'm not there at a certain point in time. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, whenever I let go and trust, it always unfolds so much beyond something that I've planned myself. And I, I think um, with this conversation, I'm going to be mindful every morning to just have a moment with God and say, okay, it's your GPS. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Where are we going today? That's but right. it's so true. The most magical moments have been the unplanned ones that unfold when we let go, when I let go. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, that's, that's a blessing. It's a yeah. blessing to, to let it go and to trust because we're really not in charge. <laughs> That's right. We're not right. in charge of the things that happen to us I mean, and around us. The only thing we're really in charge of is how we show up to those situations and circumstances. And that's the, and that's the real growth. That's the real uh, challenges that we face is to know that we're the ones that are really coloring every situation and circumstance one way or the other. And it's not the power is not in the other person and the situations or the circumstances in life or even in the detours. It's in how we interpret that. 
In fact, a few weeks ago when uh, I did a Q&A session for a Sunday service and people submitted questions and one of the questions that came in uh, turns out was from a woman who was uh, upset that the, a son that she wanted to have reconciliation with, wanted to have a, um, a relationship with, was totally non-responsive and she'd been praying and praying and was wondering, you know, am I praying wrong? What's going on? How come my prayers aren't answered? And as I explained, I said, well, here's, here's the challenge. And the challenge is about that idea about timing, is that we think our prayers may not be answered because they don't happen at the time we expect them to happen. But I pointed out to her, I said, you actually have a relationship with your son because you're praying for your son, you're holding your son in the light, and mm. when and if your son calls you, you are going to be ready, and mm. you are going to be willing to engage in a relationship no matter what the past was. And so again, I talked about releasing the attachment to time and just even releasing the prayer. God knows. You've made the prayer, you've set the intention, you're ready. When and if it happens, you are going to be ready and, and willing and able to step into that relationship. Well, I no sooner got done with that, answering that question, when the woman who submitted the question, they were all anonymous, and I didn't know this was the woman, she raised her hand and said she'd actually submitted the question. And she wanted to let me know that on Thanksgiving Day, her son called, and they had a reconciliation. Beautiful. And to me, it's just another example of a week before, it was, if my prayers aren't answered. And again, it's about that timing. And it didn't show up in the way in which I think it should show up. And to be able to see that all things are working together for good, and if we can hold to that truth, then life gets to be so much easier for us. Even though in that situation, I mean, it was very challenging not being able to have that face-to-face um, -face relationship with the son in the past. Well, now things are starting to turn. So it's yeah, that's, that's beautiful. It um, triggers in me uh, a reminder not to get attached to the form, what something looks like, but to trust that the essence. Uh, the deeper sense is, is what is unfolding. And um, we do get so attached to form, we humans. <laughs> we certainly do. I know I you know? do. You know? <laughs> <laughs> we want things to look a certain way, or if we want a car, or we want transportation, and that boat. We might say, well, it needs to be a 1974 uh, Corvette Stingray. <laughs> and then if somebody shows up with a with a Mustang or a Camaro or a Mitsubishi or something else, we don't even see it because we're thinking it only is going to look like this one form. And so what I try to do is to say, well, I want the right perfect transportation, and I'd like it to maybe be a 1974 Pontiac Grand Prix or a 74 uh, uh, a Grand Prix or a 74 Corvette, but this or something better. And so when I say that, it kind of really opens it up. So then I'm more alert to when my good shows up that I'll be able to identify it. Instead of being just tunnel vision that it has to look a certain way and it has to show up within the next week. And if it doesn't, then I figure out oh, it's never going to happen. And if I have that consciousness, then I'm never going to see it even if it does happen. So again, it comes back to what's really going on in, uh, in our own mind. In fact, it reminds me of... Uh, and it's a true story. Anybody who's worked on cars will uh, be able to attest to this. That uh, there was a time when I was scrubbing off um, oh, you know, the battery. There's like battery acid they used to build up on cars. I'm sure it probably still does. It's white and it's gross. And you get a wire brush out and you're scrubbing it off. Yes. And my brother-in-law had come along and uh, he said, Bill, uh, why don't you give me a Coke? And so I thought, okay, he's thirsty. So I gave him uh, a can of Coke. And then he poured the Coke on the battery acid and it just dissolved it immediately. Ooh. And the first thing I thought of was, I drink Coke all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering what is in this stuff that it could to do that to battery acid. But uh, the second thought I had later on upon reflection of that is uh, what kind of things am I putting in my body? Yes. You know, if the Coke could you know, do that to the battery acid, what's it doing to my body? Well, that's one way to look at it, but the physical way to look at it is also what thoughts am I carrying around in my own consciousness? Because they can be equally destructive, in fact, more destructive. Yes. If 
carrying around negative thought forms and habit patterns. It can be very destructive. I find that um, being in traffic with drivers who challenge one's uh, manner system <laughs> um, really bothers my chi. It is one of my strongest spiritual tests of where my head's at. If someone cuts me off, what do I think? Do I think uh, expletives or do I think maybe this person is going to the hospital? Maybe this person, you know, giving them the benefit of the doubt or do I immediately get into anger and ego uh, indignation? <laughs> you know, it's very telling uh, how, how we respond in the car to different situations. I think it really gives you quite insight into your psyche at that moment. Well, I think that it does, and this is just occurring to me right now, but when we think about all of us driving down the road, and we're in our little bubble that we call a car, and we think the world is just what's in our car, <laughs> and then we see all these other people driving around, and maybe everybody's car is just their consciousness, and so we all think that we're separate. And then we think that what we do isn't affecting anybody else, when in fact it does. When you cut somebody else off or there's an accident, that we actually have an effect on each other. Wouldn't it be wonderful to recognize that even in traffic, <coughs> every one of these people is actually part of a greater whole of consciousness. That we're all like strands in a web of consciousness. And how we treat each other is going to come back to us. Because we're creating a, a, a race consciousness, a human race consciousness. That's beautiful imagery, because we really are all one, and, and the car can create that illusion of separation. This is my car. <laughs> this is my <laughs> world. <laughs> As and opposed you know, to our world, right? right. Our people, highway of life. <laughs> And people say things or they may, uh, you know, give gestures on the car that aren't always very polite that they would never do in person to somebody else. If you're just walking down the street, you bumped into somebody, you would be yelling and screaming or, you know, saying expletives to them. But in the car, it's as if we feel just so isolated from each other that anything goes. And it's not a good model. <laughs> this is true. So being mindful of the spiritual rules of the road, very mm -hmm. key, very yes. key. We're all on the spiritual path together. You know, yes, we are. I heard you refer to um, Christmas as a, as a road trip. <laughs> right. I wonder, <laughs> I think that's a first, I along with your is. book. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I think about... Uh, Mary and uh, Joseph, as they were going uh, to get counted in the census, that was really a road trip that they were on. And uh, I'm sure that uh, Joseph never would have expected that they'd get to town. Uh, his wife would be just ready to give birth. He couldn't find a place to stay at the inn. He ends up in the manger. I'm sure he, he was running, maybe he was running the script about how could this be? That... I need to take care of my wife and my firstborn child, and, and the best I can do is a manger, and this seems like a huge detour from what his plan probably was, which was probably anything other than having the baby in a manger. <laughs> probably the last thing he was thinking was going to happen for the birth of his firstborn. And so he's on, I look at that and say, wow, he's on a road trip that I'm sure he thought was going completely awry. That yeah. This was not, not what he thought it was going to be. Right. And but what happens? The, Jesus is born, and then you have the shepherds coming down, and they're singing, and then the, the wise men show up, and there's gold and frankincense and myrrh, all these wonderful gifts, and all these people saying these wonderful things about their firstborn. I'm sure that shifted entirely his experience about what was happening. And again, it was that wasn't something I'm sure he expected either that those great things would happen at the same time. So maybe that's a lesson for us as we're on the, in the Christmas season right now and whatever path we're on or however fast we're running to buy presents or to um, 
connect with people or write cards or whatever it is that we're doing, can we recognize in, in all that hubbub and all the parties or other things that we may be getting involved in that maybe it's not looking exactly how it is that we thought it would look, but there's some good that's going to be here. And I find winter is just the perfect time for us to have uh, some self-reflection, to be able to look at ourselves, uh, to be able to rest, and not just be caught up in the endless running here and there. Um, if we could really rest, if we could spend some time in reflection, not unlike nature at this time of year when winter starts, uh, if we don't... Uh, if we don't remember that this is a season for rest and reflection, we just have to wait for the snow. And when the snow comes, it lays a blanket of snow over everything. Remember growing up in the Midwest? Um, that, that's, that's just a, really a metaphor for it's a time of quiet. There's a time in the springtime when things will blossom, in the summer when things are just wonderful, and then in the fall where it's time to harvest. But we have to spend time uh, in the silence. We have to spend time in some reflection. So I guess I'd say as we go through this holiday season, if we're running on an idea of, of love and connection, if that's our fuel for the car and the road of life, if we're filled with love and we're connecting with other people, that's a really good spot to be in. If we feel like we're running on empty, as the song says, then I think it's time for us to, to pull back and to say the presence or the parties, etc., is not as important as my own peace of mind as my ability to connect with friends and family in a loving way, those are the things that are really going to make this a transformative season. And honestly, most of us won't even remember what gift you got from who by the year from now. But you're not going to forget the connection that you have with each other. And so during this season, this is a great time to have the connection. Oh, I, I totally agree. And um, I had the privilege of um, hearing... Um, Matthew Fox speak this last Sunday, and he talked very much about um, how important it is to be still at this time of the year, and um, that uh, ancient times chose Christmas because it was a, a season of reflection. It was close to the shortest day of the year, the, the solstice, and um, that it's very important for us to be still and to meditate, to get in touch with the inner birth of the Christ consciousness inside of us. And with the holiday hubbub, which, I mean, I love. I love New York. has a lot of energy. There's a lot going on. The lights, the windows, the, just the fun. You don't have to spend money to have fun. You can just enjoy um, each other, the company, um, and just the, the joy of being alive, really. Um, but it, it, it really was very um, important to focus in on the stillness inside, to welcome that birth uh, mm -hmm. inside of us and, um, and to commemorate that. And I, I think that... Um, Christmas is very challenging for many people, too. You know, if, if the form does not take, if it's not perfect, you know, uh, people, unfortunately, we sometimes buy into the commercialism, which runs rampant. And if you don't have the whole perfect life that the cards, uh, you know, and perfect everything, then, uh, then it's, um, it can trigger... Um, some depression for people and and I think you know what you're saying the love and uh, being together and and being quiet inside yourself and in, enjoying simple pleasures is is very important and is really I think what's happening in the changing structure is going away from the materialism and the the external and more the internal values coming up and sharing with each other, um, and uh, and I, I I do I'm glad we're talking. This came up because I I have some friends who have a very hard time with the holidays, and and I think what we're saying is is really good to share with people. It's okay too. It's okay to be a little sad, 
you know, and honor your truth. That's absolutely, that's absolutely right. And especially if you've experienced some kind of a loss, whether it's a friend that's no longer in your life or someone has made their transition from this physical manifestation to whatever comes next, that the feeling of loss and emptiness is very real around the holidays. Mm -hmm. and so being able to connect with other people, get into grief support groups, uh, to be able to talk with other people about what's going on with your feelings and, and know that that's okay and that's part of life. To me, that's really a, a healing that can happen. And in fact, one of the reasons I wrote this book is that I was really hoping that it would be a, an opportunity for people to have real dialogue about spirituality mm -hmm. and to be able to have it with whether it's a husband or a wife or a friend who's having a challenge to be able to give them something like this book that shows spirituality in a way in which they have probably never experienced it before, mm -hmm. that it opens up an opportunity to have a dialogue about what's really going on with each other. And you hear it all the time, well, you're never supposed to talk about religion or spirituality or politics. Well, uh, I think that if we leave out that part of our life, our spiritual part of our life, that we don't fully share or explore it with our uh, close friends or family members or people that are having a challenge, that they're really missing out on a part of life that can be very rewarding and really help them through some of the darkest days and the darkest challenges. And so part of my, uh, my goal with this book was really to open up a dialogue between family members or friends uh, in a way that, again, is not about any one spiritual practice. It's just about universal spiritual principles. It's humorous. And it hopefully will open up a dialogue where we can actually talk about spiritual things and spiritual values and how does that show up in each other's lives. And to me, that's... Uh, the most rewarding thing that I can think will come from uh, from this book is to be able to create that kind of dialogue among each other. Well, I, I want to share with you, I've given this to, to several men friends who are car enthusiasts like yourself, who are, um, would probably not uh, read a book um, with spiritual in the title. <laughs> um, and they absolutely loved it. And I think the way it's written um, is it, it engages many readers. And I think it, and I'm going to give you a shameless plug here. I highly <laughs> recommend it as a, as a Christmas um, present <laughs> um, because it really is unusual and practical and it does um, inspire conversation and sharing. And um, it's, it's both practical and takes you traveling into different, different high places. <laughs> the high watch. You get to the high watch through the road to some majestic uh, views. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, well, thank you. Really. I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. And... Um, we have some more time, so I wonder if you could um, share some more about um, what, if people are being challenged with their car, uh, and their car being, being themselves, perhaps. Um, what would you, can you give some advice on? Sure. You, using the car as an analogy, one of the things that I, I look at is... And a question I've asked myself, how well do I take care of my car? Mm -hmm. And being a crazy car guy, I take very good care of my car. <laughs> uh, and I don't eat in the car, and I don't like keep, you know, keep it messy at all. I really try to take very good care of it, wax it and wash it, and make sure all the maintenance gets done, or I do it. And uh, So I've been taking really good care of my car over the years. But then I ask myself the question, uh, how good am I taking care of myself? And if I use the analogy of the car, it would be, well, am I cleaning out the trunk, as it were? Am I uh, clearing out my consciousness? Am I resting? Am I taking care of myself? Am I uh, getting spiritually uplifted? 
what are the kinds of things that I'm doing for myself? At least with the car, you have like a maintenance schedule. If you follow it, you get, you know exactly when to change the oil and the spark plugs and everything else. But again, we don't have a manual for ourselves. Uh -huh. At least we didn't until now. <laughs> <laughs> where we can start to ask ourselves those really fundamental questions about how well are we taking care of ourselves and are we taking care of our car are we taking care of maybe other people but are we really taking care of ourselves what are we doing to rest and rejuvenate what kind of things are we doing to really help ourselves because you have to help yourself before you can help somebody else. Where they say in the plane when they're explaining about the oxygen mask, you know, yeah. you got to put it on yourself before you help a small child or somebody else near you. Yeah. And I think many times in life we can be thinking about other people and not thinking about ourselves. And I don't mean that in a selfish way, but I mean it in a way in which we really do have to take care of ourselves so that we're in a position to be able to be in service and to be able to take care of other people. And so the whole idea of the car is, uh, you know, do we have air in the tires? Are we getting good gas mileage? Uh, and there's all kinds of things that we can look at mm -hmm. about taking care of our car. Mm -hmm. And I'd say that the other part of that is to really look and say, how well am I taking care of myself? Do I have air in the tires? Am I, uh, am I making sure that I'm eating well and I'm sleeping, that I'm able to engage in spiritual conversations and, and to really be real? with myself and with other people. And I call that being in the conscious relationship. Can I really be in a conscious relationship with myself mm -hmm. and with other people? Mm -hmm. If we can do that, then life is really deep. And it's really, really, that's where the meat is on the bone, as it were, <laughs> <laughs> is to have those kind of relationships versus just being on the surface. And, um, you know, that's where we spend a lot of our life is just really on the surface. But Again, the meat of it is really in being present to who we are, uh, getting a con connection with who we are internally, the spirit within, and being able to share that authentically with each other. That's really, to me, uh, one of the greatest gifts that we have the opportunity to take advantage of in our life. I agree. Thank you. Um, I think it's a good, good season to remind ourselves of that, too, because... It does become outer directed quite often, and getting and doing for others um, and watching the clock. And it is so key to take care of ourselves first, to because if we're not, if we don't do that, then we can't be present with others. And I think you right our 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 presence is our biggest present <laughs> to That's others. Right. That's well said, and if you think about it, if you get a call from a friend who wants you to run over to help him and you jump in your car and you haven't maintained the car and the car doesn't start, you're not going to be able to get over there to help him. And so if we're not doing our own inner work to really prepare ourselves and to know ourselves, uh, then we could just be trying to jump into a car to into our consciousness that's not going to be in a place to help other people. And so it really does start with looking at ourselves and giving ourselves our own spiritual tune-up. <laughs> yes, spiritual tune-up. I love that. I really do. It's great. I wonder if you'd take us on a kind of a prayerful um, journey <laughs> for the season. And um, I, I do want to mention your website. Um, can you share that with us? I know we have it on the screen. Sure. but It's uh, Unity in Marin. Dot org, dot org. So that's U N I T Y I N M A R I N dot org. And if you go to that website and just scroll down right on the home page, you'll see a picture of the book. And if you'd like to purchase it for yourself or for someone else for Christmas or any other occasion, you can just click on the link and it'll take care of it online. Great. Thank cool. you. You're welcome. And, um, wonder if you could take us on about a five-minute journey uh, meditation. Sure. Thanks. Let's do that. Let's, let's collect ourselves right here now. No matter where it is that we are, no matter where it is that you may be tuning in from, just take a few breaths so that we can center ourselves.
We center ourselves in the holy and sacred space of the present moment. For it's within the present moment that everything occurs. We release the past, any anxiety, any thoughts of anything that preceded this now moment. And we set those aside. And we also set aside any thoughts of our to-do list, what we're going to do after this time together. For we know that will take care of itself. So now that we've let go of the past and the future, we can be fully present to this moment, right here and right now. And it's in this moment that we're reminded of what the Christmas season is all about. The birth of a new consciousness within us is available to us. And we're reminded of it in no uncertain terms during this Christmas season. And we each can have our own birth of a new consciousness, of a new you, of a new me. It may be during times of struggle that this birth is taking place. It may be time of great joy that this birth is taking place. Whatever prompted it, let us be grateful for it. And know that Spirit is bringing us gold and frankincense and love on a metaphysical level to welcome us into this new consciousness, this new rich way of living and be is at hand. So as we walk through this time, with the lights and the trees and the presence, let us be reminded gifts of spirit that are with us every day, waiting us to lay claim to. And so without hesitation, we lay claims to our gifts, whatever they may be. And know that we're guided and protected, loved and directed. So we give thanks for it all. And whenever we say Merry Christmas this year, or during this time, let it be a reminder of this truth, of the new consciousness being born in us. And so it is. Amen. Amen. Well, Bill, thank you for being an original wise guy here <laughs> in bringing <laughs> your gifts of the spiritual rules of the road and your creative insights. I've really enjoyed our time together. And I, for one, will be ordering several copies for friends. And um, I wish you a, a very blessed, joyous, happy time. Well, Merry Christmas and happy holidays to you too, Jude, and to all your listeners. Blessings. Thank you. Blessings. And blessings to everybody who's tuned in today. Um, as Bill was saying, every time you say Merry Christmas, that's saying Merry Christmas to yourself first and the birth of the... Christ consciousness in you and in our inner divinity and sharing that with the world. Have a beautiful week and a beautiful holiday season.
you're celebrating Hanukkah, happy Hanukkah. Happy Kwanzaa. And just happy day, happy life. Many blessings to you.